I have a story time today that is about Section 8 that you better not be faint of heart to hear this story. It's not a good story what happened to this person, but I am sharing it because it was very kind of him to put this story up on Facebook so it could be a learning experience for people. And I'm going to break it down and I'm going to read to you what he put on Facebook and some of the comments and we're all gonna learn from this experience that he went through so that you never have to. So I'm Monique Burns, my husband and I have been buying houses in Detroit since 2007. Our first tenant moved in in 2008 and she has Section 8 and she is still there. And I have always been a fan of Section 8 so the story doesn't scare me at all and it, it goes very well for us. We, my husband and I buy houses in Detroit that are distressed, we renovate them, and we sell them to investors from all over the world and all over the country, so if that is something you're interested in, uh, we do have a bit of a waiting list right now, but you can get on my exclusive buyer list. In all my years of uh, my own properties, having uh, two different property management companies, and placing tenants throughout all these years, I have learned a lot about Section 8, and so I did make an online course because, you know, you never know what it is that you don't know. And my course is very affordable, link below, check it out. And it's very Detroit specific, but I made it affordable enough that if you're in another city, you are definitely gonna learn a lot because Section 8 is actually a federal program. And I recommend knowing everything that you can. It's nine hours of education, which might scare some people away, but you don't know what it is that you don't know about Section 8 and having Section 8 tenants. So let's get into it with what happened to this person. And I'm not going to share names. This was on the Wayne Metro Real Estate Investors. I think that's what it's called. But if you search those words, you'll see there's a great big group in Detroit. Wayne is the county that Detroit is in. There's a great big group here and it's investors, property managers, um, landlords, uh, construction, wholesalers, real estate agents, everybody gets together and um, very nicely shares information. And he shared the story, so let me read it to you. <laughs> so we placed a Section 8 tenant in a three bedroom rental in Dearborn Heights 21 days ago. My experience is all Detroit specific. Dearborn Heights is right outside of Detroit. Yesterday, we get a letter from a Section 8 caseworker that the contract has been canceled effective immediately. So far, this could all happen. When he said letter, I think he means email. I mean, I've seen in the mail, um, the only time I get anything from Section 8, it's a form, and it's when somebody changes their rental amount, or it's, it's when the tenant's rental amount has changed, like the tenant's income changed, and Section 8 is telling you, it's called an HAP adjustment form. Anyway, uh, the contract has been canceled effective immediately. The keys are on the kitchen counter. What? Why would a caseworker know where the keys are? That one is very sus to me. And it tells me that was not a Section 8 caseworker. They don't tell you things about like that kind of thing. No way, no how. And that we can dispose of any personal property remaining as the tenant has left the state. <laughs> So maybe the letter would have been the tenant, the, the contract is canceled because the tenant ported to another state. Um, porting is when they have to switch. Like I've got somebody porting right now from, I think it's Macomb County into Wayne County to be my tenant. She's super good. Normally I don't like dealing with people porting. I made a video about that um, because it takes a lot of time, but this was a really exceptional tenant. So I'm waiting for it, but porting is a, is a big deal. But when a tenant suddenly ports out, I mean, I don't know how that works because they're supposed to be there for a year. It doesn't seem like that. Well, I know that's not a thing that they're allowed to do in the middle of their voucher because they're under a one-year contract. The tenant moved in for a year. They're not just going to port to another state. It doesn't work like that. And then this part kills me. And then it says, and that we can dispose of any personal property remaining as the tenant has left the state. Okay. <laughs> There, I'm not a lawyer, and you can ask, you can line up five lawyers in Detroit, or I don't know, wherever you live, and say, how do you know a tenant is truly gone? And it's this whole big thing. Like, every lawyer is going to answer a little differently. I've heard, like, if there is so much as a pencil on the floor, you don't actually know they're gone, so you need a bailiff. And then I've heard another one say, well... If there's milk in the refrigerator and a toothbrush and toothpaste still there, they're not gone. 
And then, you know, it goes on and on. So this is a question for a lawyer. Is the tenant actually gone? A Section 8 caseworker is by no means ever, ever going to tell you to get rid of someone's belongings. That's crossing a major line. But the story gets even better. Okay. A, if you are liking this, it helps me tremendously if you subscribe, if you like, if you comment. So the guy writing the post says, I go to the house, let myself in, and find a whole other family living there. <laughs> okay, that's scary. He let himself in and there was a family living there. They had new cable installed. They had furniture delivered. And they stated that they paid the Section 8 tenant, who just signed the lease with him, the first two months rent so they could move in a week ago. <laughs> Section 8 isn't responding. First of all, I don't think his first tenant was Section 8 because that is not how it works. So if you have somebody apply and it's Section 8, you need to be sure that you are emailing the Section 8 office. So I'm wondering if he got fake move-in papers <laughs> It, with a fake email address on it. I know all the email addresses of the Section 8 offices. It's something I put together. I've got a spreadsheet of, of, of contact information in all the different Section 8 offices that comes with my course. So if you're in another city, I'm not really sure how you'd know for sure that that's the right address. <laughs> but Section 8's not gonna talk to you like that for, you know, at all. Like, did they fake this whole Section 8 moving thing. And so now, <laughs> the next subject, there's another family living there, so what is he supposed to do? So let me get into some of the comments that people wrote. There were over 100 people in Detroit commenting, and I only highlighted a few of them. People suck, don't be one of them. Seems that they were doing the right thing. Work with them. <laughs> so, We've had it happen, not necessarily with Section 8, but when we're in the process of renovating a house, that somebody suddenly has moved into our house. And I, this happened recently. We were in the middle of actually evicting somebody, and it was such a long, dragged out case, and it's, the courts were still backlogged pretty badly from uh, COVID, and my husband went to the house and discovered it wasn't the person that we were evicting living there anymore. And I said to him, I was all tough. I'm like, you go, we're just gonna call the police and call them trespassers. Cause that's the thing, you can't say that they're squatters because the police are taught if you say squatter that they say, this is a civil matter. It's like they all had a class. Okay, policeman, if someone says the word squatter, you say, this is a civil matter. Okay, and they won't help you. But if you say, oh my gosh, someone's trespassing, the police show up with guns a blazing, you know? So, um, anyway, my husband gets to the door and my husband's a nice guy and I probably would have done the same thing. The woman answers the door. She's got twins that are handicapped. She rented the house from somebody thinking that she was renting the house. We're like, oh my gosh. And she couldn't have been a nicer lady. So we ended up giving her money to move. So you would think that would be the reasonable thing, right? You pay them to move. They paid all the money they had in the world to move in for this house that I'm sure they paid less than the going rate of rent to live there. Why else would they do that, right? Um, looks too good to be true. It probably is. It's probably not the landlord's house if the rent's too low for you tenants who are watching. <sighs> so the guy who wrote the post about how people suck, don't be one of them. He writes back, the guy who wrote the post, and he said, they don't qualify at all. Pile of drugs on the dining room table. Two of the three have no jobs. The one with the job is not working due to an injury. And one just got out of prison and is on parole. And then I kind of enjoyed this other comment. Somebody wrote, weed is legal. <laughs> hey, eh. He didn't clarify which drugs, you know. And then I also just enjoyed this one. So I'm just going to share it. Somebody else wrote, all these groups have about 25% renter advocates, communists, anarchists, socialists, or worse. Why are you in this group? What? <laughs> but the conclusion to the story is he did an update. And I told you this isn't Detroit, where if he said the word squatter, Detroit would be like, this is a civil matter. Um, 
so that didn't happen. Um, he, he was in Dearborn Heights and he said the Dearborn Heights police are here. Trespassing trio given until 9 p.m. to vacate. Police are coming back at 9 p.m. so we can rekey or all three will be charged. Update, 8.50 p.m. The property is rekeyed, windows are locked, and we have possession. Horror story, but you can learn from it. And you can learn from my course. Thank you so much for watching this video. Um, 